Hello and welcome to London Guided Walks podcast. In the coming episodes, we will be sharing our love and passion for London, its people, places and history in an espresso shot with a splash of personality. For those of you who don't know me, I am Hazel Baker, founder of londonguidedwalks.co.uk, providing guided walks, private tours and treasure hunts to Londoners and visitors alike, and now bringing you a jam-packed podcast during the time of the coronavirus. My first memory of London was when I was a brownie at six years old. And we came down and we went to the Tower of London. And it wasn't the bloody tower and the torture chamber or indeed the armour that impressed me. Oh no, it was the bling. It was the crown jewels. And that is today's subject. The crown jewels reside under armed guard in the jewel house at the Tower of London. It's such a unique working collection of royal regalia, with some still being used by the Queen for important and national ceremonies, such as the state opening of Parliament, and others are only used at a monarch's coronation. Joining me today is Zoe Merritt, a certified London junkie, having worked at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, the Tower of London, and also St Paul's Cathedral. I cannot imagine working in such an historically fabulous place such as the Tower of London with such a unique collection of sacred and ceremonial objects, um, including all those super shiny jewels. I know. It was it's a bit of a bizarre experience because you see them without all the people there and you're like, wow. And the fibre optic units with accent lighting is spectacular, isn't it? Oh, yeah, definitely. And you're just like... Especially in the morning when there's no one there and you're just opening up and everything and you're just like gaze at their incredibleness. And did you have a particular favourite display case or item that you absolutely loved? I have always been torn between the Queen Mother's consort crown because it mm-hmm. was the one made of solid platinum because the lady had class. She most certainly did. I mean, I can't get over how the... A Queen Mother's Consort crown was set with 2,800 diamonds. And of course, that includes the infamous Koenor diamond, uh, one of the largest cut diamonds in the world, weighing 105.6 carats. Practical too, because it's also on a detachable platinum mount. You said you were torn, so what was your other favourite? The Imperial State crown, because it's got some of the most historic stuff in it but it's amazing but the thing is like the Tower of London is like on about how the fact that the spoon is the oldest item in the crown jewels and I'm like well it's mm-hmm. not because technically there's the, the ruby in the imperial state crown and the sapphire which are older because the ruby in the, the imperial state crown was given to Edward the Black Prince after he helped out Pedro of Castile in the civil war mm-hmm. in Spain. um and the sapphire was it's known as St Edward's sapphire, which was worn by a ring with Ed, by Edward the Confessor. And I'm like, the Tower of London are technically saying that the spoon is the oldest thing when it's really not. So the uh, so the it's an imperial state crown that you mentioned uh, with all the uh, the Black Prince ruby in that, um, yeah. and that's the one that the the Queen wears, isn't it, for opening Open. state opening of Parliament? Yes, yeah, it is. Visitors to the Crown Jewels, seeing all this world famous priceless collection. Do they believe it's real? Some did. Some just believed that it was false, that it wouldn't be on public display as it is. But technically, they're not owned by the Crown. They're owned by the country. Of course, they're going to be on display. And what other sort of questions were you asked? There was just loads of questions that we always got with regards to who's going to be next in line, who's going to be king. Everyone thought that Charles wasn't going to be king, even though he is and they thought it would jump straight to William and just with like the whole monarchy itself I think people just didn't quite believe that the wealth of it all. Now that spoon I do remember seeing it is rather beautiful and quite delicate and that's used for the oil at the coronation and then that's next to I can't remember what kind of bird it is for to holding the oil. So it's the official name is the ampulla but it's an eagle now they use oh. an eagle because an eagle is said to fly above the clouds in Christianity and mm-hmm. seen as a messenger of God because it can fly that high. So they use it as a religious symbolism. Now, some of you listeners may be wondering why we're going on about an 11th century coronation spoon. Well, that's because most of the royal collection that we had uh, was destroyed uh, in the Civil War. 
Now, this was during the reign of Charles I. Now, the civil wars uh, that began in 1642 effectively ended with the execution of Charles I in January 1649. Now, after his execution, many of the crown jewels were sold or destroyed in effectively removing all sacred symbols of the monarchy. Uh, the Lord Protector, Oliver Cromwell, ordered that the orb and scepters should be broken down as they stood for the detestable rule of kings. Uh, the coronation regalia was then brought to the Tower of London and destroyed by order of Parliament. Um, they ordered that the highly symbolic coronation regalia be totally broken and defaced. Now, officials at the Tower's jewel house put up a fight. There was Carew Mildway, who was the jewel house clerk, and he was a royalist sympathiser and made things as difficult as possible, even refusing to hand over the keys to these parliamentarians. Finally, he was arrested and imprisoned and the doors to the jewel house um, strong room uh, were broken down. Now, the precious stones were prized out of the crowns and sold and the gold frames were sent to the tower mint to be melted down and turned into coins. Uh, and they were stamped with Commonwealth of England. And these coins, these 1649 coins, were produced following Cromwell's Puritan beliefs. The wording appeared in English rather than Latin. The monarch's portraiture was abandoned, resulting in a very heraldic coin uh, bearing the cross of St. George on both sides because of course what do you do if you don't have a monarch's head on one of them uh, all the gemstones as I mentioned they were removed and they were sold and it basically just got lost um, with, within that and that's why this spoon is so important. It's one of the original um, pieces. And then, of course, it then took an absolute fortune and a lot of dedication to try and rebuild the crown jewels that you see now. So two new scepters and an orb um, costed £12,185 to be remade for the coronation of Charles II in 1661. And that's the restoration of the monarchy when uh, Cromwell was no more and this is a subject that we cover on our wonders of whitehall tour as well so 1666 charles ii um, is now back the monastery has been restored 1661 uh, the coronation is booked uh what next so charles ii pretty much had to restore the whole of the crown jewels from scratch and what he could find from what that was sold off had to pretty much recreate the whole thing and that's where the um the spoon comes into play isn't it because it was so i think the soul it was one of the few items that wasn't destroyed and sold mm -hmm. off to a gentleman of the royal bedchamber who kept it and then sold it back to charles ii who gratefully accepted thankfully and uh, what about um charles ii's um involvement in remaking all of this um regalia was he was he involved or did, did he just i mean he was a man of style wasn't he surely he, he would have wanted to get into uh, designing a, a bling he did and as such some of it was very much in the old traditional style but there's a few pieces if you look um it's one of the big plates which is known as the last supper plate he has a bit of his own stamp on it king charles cavaliers on it a checkerboard floor and a, and a chandelier on the last supper plate which obviously didn't exist in the last supper it kind of has his little bit of a stamp as such so he was a bit more of a stickler for tradition in some ways yes i think especially with the crown jewels i think they have to have the particular symbols of christianity and the role with the church and, and i suppose it helps him uh, reaching into the mm. past to show that he actually belonged there definitely and what about the scepters i remember seeing two one with a huge diamond on top what was that so there are two main scepters one is a symbol of kingship and authority. That's the one with the column and one in it. And there's also a scepter with a dove at the top with open wings. Now, the open wings is a symbol of the monarch and their power. But the one with the column and one in it is the most important one. Um, that was adapted, obviously, when they found the column and diamond because that was a much later addition to the crown jewels. I mean, it's huge, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely huge. It's like 502 carats of diamond. Wow. Hard to get your head around that, isn't it? Hmm. And I've been lucky enough to see it out of the case and everything, and it's amazing. 
And what are these crown jewels for? Are they only for coronations? So a lot of the crown jewels are simply for coronational purposes. So some items mm -hmm. haven't been used since obviously the Queen's coronation in 83. Some items are used more regularly. So obviously the Imperial State Crown is used every year for the state opening of Parliament. And there's some items that are used for things like Maundy Thursday. Technically, they wouldn't have been used this year because of lockdown, but they would go out every year mm -hmm. to different places within England when the Queen delivers Maundy money. And also there would be the baptismal font, which be used, would be used for baptisms uh, of the royal family. So would have been last officially used for quite possibly Archie, which was um, for Harry and Meghan's boy last year. I mean, there's a lot of bling there. Do many people think it's um, solid gold? The only thing that's really solid gold is the St Edward's crown, which is solid 22 karat gold. Everything else is silver gilt, so it's solid silver covered in gold because gold as a metal is generally quite weak. So mm -hmm. they usually use a solid, much more solid base and then cover it in gold just because it makes it stronger and it will last longer. That makes more sense. And because there, there have been a few um, accidents, haven't there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think um, the, it was James II's coronation banquet in, um, in 1685 and the sovereign scepter with the cross was uh, badly damaged. Um, I think they think it uh, possibly rolled off the table during the celebrations. Um, and then two jewelled pieces were later found on the floor of Westminster Hall. Now, Queen Victoria's imperial state crown was carried by the elderly Duke of Argyll for the state opening of Parliament. And he had it on a cushion and he dropped it and it hit the ground and it got crushed and squashed. And Queen Victoria writes how uh, it looked like a pudding that had sat down. Shows you how uh, difficult it is when you know you've got so, that amount of money on a pillow in, in your yes, hands. Yes, and it was also during, I think it was during the coronation of George the fifth where the Edward's crown was put on backwards oh what gems are on the right way round? how can so you tell if, it's a shame i haven't got a picture to show you but if you're looking straight directly at the St. Edward's crown there in the cross there's like a green stone in the top of the cross and a red stone and that's how you know it's the front but for some reason mm -hmm. and also they used to put a string at the front the string got lost and all taken off and so for george the fifth it got put on backwards oopsie the crown's supposed to be really difficult to wear because it's not something that you, you're used to wearing every day. And um, they must be vastly heavy with all of those jewels and silver and gold gilt and all the rest of it. And then, of course, they're really tall as well, aren't they? Yes. So the St Edward's crown weighs five pounds, which is about, in kilograms, is just roughly about 2.2 .2 kilograms, which is quite heavy. So mm. they only wear it for 15 to 20 minutes. The imperial state crown is a lot less because it's not solid gold so thankfully the queen doesn't have to really suffer that much now when she's wearing it and also they pad it out to make it much more comfortable for them to wear but they... i suppose you've got to have a few practices with it before uh, going out in public yes and that's um so if anyone's ever watched the crown where in the first series that she's leading up to the coronation she did actually train try things on and that's one of the few things of the crown that's actually true, that she did actually practice wearing them before the big day. And the imperial state crown, I mean, there's so many diamonds on that, aren't there? I mean, it's just absolutely covered in, in sparkle. Yeah. And it also has a cunnan two on the front of it, which is 317 carats worth of diamond. So there's a definitely a lot of bling. I tell you one of my favourite ones out of all time, though, and you're seeing these all these big, impressive ones. The uh, small diamond crown that Queen Victoria had made. I know because it's so cute and it's so tiny. Yeah, it is. I just thought it was. It made me feel really sad thinking about how she is a a mother to nine children. She is a new widow. She is the Queen of England, and so she's got all of these different roles that she needs to do all at the same time. And so a crown is just not going to allow her to wear her widow's weaves. So to have this um, designed so she can do her duty and be the, the widow as well, uh, I thought that was rather, rather clever. And I love, I love the fact that when she also passed, she because it was made out of her own jewels, it was actually hers. 
So when she passed, she actually donated it to the country. So that's why it became part of the display of the crown jewels because she donated because it was her gift to the nation. Oh, that's lovely. Because it, it, she um, she used um, Queen Charlotte's nuptial crown, didn't she, as a bit of a, a, a basis for creation of this one. And that went back to Queen Charlotte's family. Yeah. So it's, it's nice to have something um, that's so delicate. Because, of course, we think of um, Queen Victoria as like this uh, rather round woman in, in black looking rather severe. But, of course, um, you know, she was made a widow at the age of 42. That's no age. And, of course, it shows her a feminine side, which we don't often see once she becomes a widow. Definitely agree. And the fact that it just is so small and dainty and feminine, Mm. and it's just so simple compared to everything else in there. Yes. It does look the odd one out. Definitely. And for those who haven't been to see the Crown Jewels at all or haven't been for a while, um, it's more of an exhibition now. It's not just a glass and containers with all the the crown jewels there's a conveyor belt there's a a journey explaining uh, the importance of the jewels and the history and the heritage there and about coronations themselves so you can learn really quite a lot in that time oh yeah definitely it's just more of a it gives you more of a an overview of kind of the monarchy as a whole and part that they play in the coronation and the build-up and it kind of goes in sequence of how they would be laid out during coronation of the kind of the steps you would get through which is good and i think it gives kind of people a bit more of a an insight rather than just oh oh there's a crown or there's a spoon sometimes people don't necessarily know what they're looking at yeah, that, that certainly helps. But saying that, you know, if you saw these out in the the world, I don't think you'd get to see the real colours like you do, how they're, how they're set up in there with those, the mm. lights and the, you know, the backdrop drop and that. It's, it's really quite beautiful. Because when you look at, if you ever see the Queen with her crown on in Parliament, it doesn't look the same. Like, mm-hmm. I always think it looks a bit duller because of the lighting. Parliament, and you yeah. look at it in where it is in the crown jewels, and you're like, "Stay here all the time, please." Yes, I thought that about my engagement yeah. ring as well. <laughs> Wasn't there a Colonel Blood and his accomplices who uh, tried to uh, steal some of the crown jewels? Do you remember yes. that? So basically, he attempted to steal the crown jewels during the reign of Charles II. Pretty much managed, he got in, bumped the guy over the head with a bar or some kind of weapon, got to the exit of the the Tower of London before he got caught. However, he got pardoned. Basically, he refused to talk to anyone but Charles II. Charles II agreed and let him off with a pension and lands and his life still. Hmm. I wonder what he said to Charles. As I always like to like to joke with reporters, quite possibly an insurance scam if it could work possibly that was just a theory Mm. one of the new things for 2020 is that his royal highness the prince of wales investiture coronet is on display in the jewel house for the first time now the coronet is part of the royal collection and has joined the other coronets of the other two prince of wales Uh, for the investiture as prince of wales at carnarvon castle in 1969 prince charles wore the contemporary coronet um, designed by architect and goldsmith louis osmond and i do think it's rather stylish it's made of gold and platinum and set with diamonds and emeralds with the purple velvet and ermine cape of estate now don't forget those who are residents of tower hamlets you're able to get entrance into the tower of london for a mere pound so you need to uh, bring your idea store card um, also with a proof of identity and also make sure when you uh, go it's not in lockdown So that's all we have time for for today. I hope you enjoyed it and learnt a few new things. Big thanks too to Zoe for taking the time to share her love of London with us. If you would like a subject covering in an episode or indeed you want to come and join me for an episode yourself, then please go to londonguidedwalks.co.uk forward slash podcast and that's where also our show notes are.